let's uh, let's move directly into our next panel. Um, I'm going to pass things over actually to Sarah Barnes Humphrey, uh, who is uh, host of Let's the Let's Talk Supply Chain podcast, among a um, host of other things that she's doing. So I really appreciate her taking some time today to join us and and uh, and oversee a panel that she was going to do at El Dorado uh, again yesterday that was looking at um, how the what the impact of uh, robotic process automation and and, and uh, just automation in general how that's sort of going to change the face of logistics in years to come so I'll let uh, I'm going to turn things over to Sarah and let her introduce her panel Thank you, Eric. I am so excited for this today and that we were still able to do our panel today. You guys can hear me okay? That's yeah, fine. Yeah. Yes. All good. All right. So thank you, Brian, for putting all of this together. I think this is, you know, just an amazing thing. And we don't have a lot of time, so let's get right to it. So our panel is The Bots Are Coming, How RPA Might Change the Face of Logistics. So before we dive in, let's get to know the panelists. Uh, today. Brian, you didn't get a lot of time to prepare, so I'm going to kind of throw a question in here, but I know that you've got this covered. So let's start with who, who you are, what you do, and besides your own tech, what is your favorite tech on the market? Okay, oh, Brian, God. I'll give you some time to think Killing about me. that. So Matt, I'm going to start with you. Yeah, my name is Matt Motzik. I'm CEO of RPA Labs. And what we do is we provide software bots for the logistics and supply chain industry. Uh, the tech that I'm interested in are the robots that actually clean up the ocean. Ah, I love seeing that. And that's a good one. We can get, if we can get a little bit more commercial on that, you may maybe get Maersk, you know, to maybe add a cleanup, uh, you know, on the back of their vessel. Yes. Where, you know, clean up some, uh, you know, let's, while we're, while we're going across the Pacific, let's, let's go ahead and clean it up on the way. Right. Love it. That is a great one. Welcome Matt. Now Jenna. Hey, uh, I'm Jenna. I'm the co-founder of ShipMax. Uh, we provide a uh, plug and play automation for text extraction. Uh, so for example, taking data from bills of ladings or whatever. Uh, favorite technology, you actually told me you were gonna ask this and I could I know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, let's say maybe keeping in the context of supply chain, um, I think one of the coolest bits of technologies um, I've seen and um, kind of cheating a bit because it's an integration partner of ours uh, is a company called Sedna. Uh, it's an email client, uh, but it's um, built for group email and it's programmable. Um, so uh, you can really sing that up with the IERP systems and, and do some pretty cool stuff around that. Awesome. Love that. All right, Brian, you're up next. Uh, Every, right, I mean, I'm, everybody knows who you are yeah, at this I'm not point. Gonna, I'm not going to reintroduce myself. I'll, I'll jump. So I, I'm looking at the list of people that are presented so far, uh, and I think we have four of our integration partners that we've already talked to. <laughs> five, I'm sorry, five of them, including this panel. Uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna avoid the industry a little bit because we. we <laughs> I think so. Way too many. <laughs> I'm honestly gonna say Google Chrome books. So, I'm I'm sitting on my desk right now. I have my Chromebook that I use every day and a Mac that I'm using for this session. Nice. And the thing I love about the Chromebooks is, and and this does tie back to the industry, is they are truly plug and play. Right, you turn it on. Yeah. I know if I drop it, I'm going to be able to just pick up the next one. And, you know, at some point when we look at all these standards and all this automation, it's really so when there's a massive shift in the industry, like, um, you know, like the virus or the tariffs, we should be able to do the same thing amongst our supply chain. Right. Yeah. And right now supply chains work a lot more like if you lose your Mac than they do <laughs> like if I lose my Chromebook. Absolutely. I love it. I see. I knew you would nail that question, <laughs> even with no preparation. All right. So while I was doing some prep for this panel, I came across a quote from Guy Cortin on LinkedIn, formerly of Infor. And I just want to throw this by you before we get into the panel. So unfortunately, I believe AI and machine learning have been hijacked by marketing efforts. We throw around the terms too easily, almost too lazy in our thinking. There has always been a need to infuse numbers and math into strategy, operations, supply chains, marketing, selling, and all aspects of business. The power and reach of the math has grown in large part to digitalization. End of the day, 
today, we are trying to conduct business in a profitable manner. And so that leads me kind of into my next question, you know, tell the audience why RPA is not like AI and machine learning and why, why is it more practical and achievable to be more profitable? And I'm going to start with Matt on this one. Matt, Matt you're lost. muted. Sorry. There we go. I, I think that, I think that AI and machine learning are powerful. I think that, um, However, I think AI, like the words digital and digitization, have been have been oversold. And you know, when when a company you know says the word digital, um, it or AI, it's almost like um, you know they're they're putting something behind the scenes and they're they're doing things behind the scenes without someone knowing. Um, a little bit with RPA though, RPA is 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 really technology running scripts that you can actually see things happen. You can see, uh, you know, the progress, um, uh, you, you can see it working. So I, I think that's a little bit different, let's say, than AI and machine learning. But just, just, you know, let's be clear. Robotic process automation requires AI and machine learning to really make it happen. So it, it has to be used um, you know, within the, uh, the, a the RPA realm. Awesome. What about, uh, Jenna, do you want to jump in here? Yeah. So I'll just, maybe I'll just kick off some definitions to make sure everyone's on the same page. And um, basically when I think of RPA, I really think of back in the day when you're recording uh, a macro on Excel, you just run through some actions and it just repeats it. So yeah, I do actually think, um, you can have pure, uh, RPA with, with no intelligence at all baked in. Um, and actually a lot of vendors in the market are, are in that position. Um, and then I think where I hate the word AI, but let's use machine learning. Um, uh, where machine learning can come in is any task which just requires a little bit more, um, let's say intelligence around it, it, it acting rather than just a kind of sheer rule based thing. And so I'd say there's a kind of newer breed of automation um, softwares, which include that machine learning. Um, and coming back to your question on how that can make you more profitable, um, let's say there are some, some highly repetitive tasks in logistics. And um, let's say in, in our case, like data extraction, very simply, if you can automate some of those tasks, it just helps you scale up more efficiently. So you need um, kind of less human bodies and um, doing those automated tasks uh, for you to handle um, the same amount of shipments. Absolutely. So why don't you like the word AI? Do you kind of agree with Guy that it's over marketed or? I think um, very few companies are using true AI. Um, there's probably a lot more machine learning. It's, yeah, it, it is a marketing phrase. <laughs> Got it. Got it. Brian, did you want to jump in here with uh, any of that? Yeah. So, well, I agree that AI is a term without a definition. Uh, whenever you have that, it's a little scary. Um, mm -hmm. But what I would say about RPA, uh, you know, I think, and I'm going back to sort of my role as, a, you know, a former CIO of a forwarder, is there's technology that you can implement, like um, sort of machine learning for analytics that you measure in months or years and you do a long project and at the end, you probably have something. With RPA, it's like if you put in an RPA solution on Monday and you don't see that your world's better on Tuesday, you can change it. But <laughs> that's the time, not necessarily the time for ROI, but definitely the time for like, you know, if you're using Jenna's thing, yesterday you were typing in, you know, a bill of lading and today you're not typing in a bill of lading or, right. you know, Matt's bot answering an email that yesterday you were answering by hand. So you very clearly know whether you're getting a benefit very, very quickly. It's much more precise than those other terms, which are sort of broad based and, uh, you know, can be can be co-opted by marketing really easily. Yeah. And I'm glad that you brought it up because it puts it into real terms as to really the profit and the benefit of using RPA in your everyday. And instead of, and also when you're supposed to see, not necessarily the ROI, but when you're going to see that benefit really work in your favor. And like you said, you know, there's something wrong if you're not seeing it within a couple of days, <laughs> you know what I mean? 
Like if you're, if it's a week down the road and you're not seeing the benefit, um, then there's, there's something wrong and you can deal with it right away, I guess. We, we may have just set a very high bar for Matt and Jenna. <laughs> <laughs> see, what, see what they have to say about you that. You guys want to weigh in on that before I move on? I'm up for that challenge. <laughs> oh yeah? All right. You heard it here, folks, on the panel at Virtual El Dorado. Jenna has taken on that challenge. <laughs> All right. So next question, actually, I'm going to start with you, Jenna. Um, we're talking a lot about talent in supply chain. And I think there is, you know, a big gap between not being able to find talent and then talent being actually, um, or jobs, I guess, being reduced because of RPA, especially in the 3PL world. So what are these, what are these realities? You know, 3PLs are very human dependent. So what exactly is RPA going to do for supply chain jobs? Yeah. So I do, I think there's a lot of um, kind of fear around this and I, I don't think there needs to be fear. I think as you kind of wrote, alluded, um, there is a shortage of talent. The industry is still growing. Um, it is a skilled, um, skilled job. And as that trend continues, automation will just help companies adapt to that new equilibrium. Um, I also think for jobs, it will make those jobs um, a nicer environment to work. So what we common like commonly see is that you know these are skilled people and a bunch of their time right now is spent doing really low admin repetitive data entry or whatever task you can take those away and start giving them the ability to add, add better value to their customers and um, and also don't forget there are new tasks that are coming on the market as a result of these um technologies being in place so for example um let's say more and more customers are looking for kind of better quality um better quality reporting or something like that right and, um as you start um as more customers let's say right now you might give your largest customers sku level reports and um, you do not physically have the labor to provide that level of service to everyone so Automation one allows you to to kind of step up and provide that service to everyone, but then also the humans that are not having to do that task anymore can come and add the extra analysis and service and input on top of that to keep providing that that customer service. And I think it's really no secret that the cost of acquiring a new customer is far greater than retaining your own ones. So yeah, I I think it's. I don't think we should be too scared about automation really impacting jobs over the whole. Okay. No, I like that. I mean, you know, there, like you said, there is some fear, you know, so how do we equate that to actually growth that's going to benefit everybody? And what does that mean? Right. Is it just about reskilling? I mean, that's a whole different panel and a whole different discussion, but um, so I think just because of time, we're going to go to the next one, Matt, I want to start with you. So what are some of the common use cases that you've seen so far on how logistics companies are using RPA? Well, I think you got to look at also the, um, the issues, the current issues right now leading up to the use cases. So for instance, I'm just going to take logistics companies as an example. Um, there's, there's a couple different problems that they're, that they're facing. One is they're receiving too many emails on a daily basis from customers. Even though the logistics company says, go to my portal and get a rate. The problem is that all these other shippers, are, you know, all these other forwarders and logistics companies are saying, go to my portal. So what do they do is they, they go back to what they do best and that's emailing out blind right. copy, you know, the, the, the freight forwarders or logistics companies, Hey, can I get a rate or where's my, you know, where's my shipment? So it seems to be, you know, that's a little bit of the, the email overload. The second, the second piece is really more, you know, these, these logistics companies have uh, cube farms, right of people just rekeying and inputting um you know like bills of ladings arrival notices uh commercial invoices in you know it's all about to us it's about you know basically reading those documents um you know via rpa reading interpreting um and then and then also just migrating that that uh metadata you know into the the tms or the erp systems 
So those are, those are just some common cases. And then, you know, the other ones are just like workflow, just, just automated triggered workflows. Um, and, and these are just things that, you know, just common, um, you, you know, common even TMS systems don't even have, which is crazy because, um, you know, these, these larger TMS systems, they have 60 screens, right? They right. should only have six or seven screens if yeah. RPA and, and automated, you know, processes are working. There's no need to double, double key in, you know, the same, the same different formats, you know, from the documents. So just, just, in, just to give you a little example, you know, one of the things that we did was, um, you know, back, back to the, um, you know, the document side, you know, right. We have a, a freight forwarder that, that does around 2000 shipments a month and they have, you know, they have so many people just rekeying and inputting directly into the system. So what we're doing is we're basically automating their whole process, you know, going from, you know, um, you know, someone going into um, the, the document and rekeying everything in. Instead, what we're doing is our RPA is automatically seeing, opening up the attachment from the email, opening up that document, identifying and classifying what type of document it is, and then, and then taking that metadata and pushing it into, into systems. So I'm, 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 sorry, I'm just going to jump in here with the, we've got a question from the audience and I think it's, it's kind of timely on this one. So how do we evaluate logistics partners and customers capabilities? When you engage with someone, how can you know that you're up against what you're up against before you dive in and commit to a plan? And that question came from Stephen Wart. Do you want to just answer that since you were kind of talking about the examples? Yeah, to me, I think, I think uh, shippers are now evaluating logistics providers on response time, quite honestly. If, yeah. if you're taking too long to respond to a quote, to um, basically get shipping documents out back to the customer, you're taking way too long. So, you know, back in the 90s and 2000s, you know, maybe 24 hours was fine, but now it's, it's into the minutes to hours for us. So awesome. um, I think that's how RPA can really speed up how, how companies uh, react to their and respond to their customers. Jenna, I know you want to jump in here on this one. Yeah. So, um, and, and I think coming back to like how, um, I think it's a good question on how customers can evaluate all these different vendors. Um, I think there's two things to this. I think one, um, I really encourage people to go back to the, the problem they're trying to solve and really detail what that is because um i do see a lot of the time when people go out to procure a software and people throw all these kind of features at them that actually are great but not valuable in solving that problem so that will just keep right. that scope really clear and then second to that um most companies especially if you're thinking about the the place we lie like in data extraction will be able to run a small pilot to show you the and um, the quality of that and before you have to go and commit to those kind of annual contracts. Right. And then I guess on that same note, are there misconceptions that need to be overcome when it comes to RPA? Like what are some of the objections that you guys are coming across? The biggest thing I have seen is companies seem to know that they have a problem on this mm -hmm. and it's taking the right tool for the job. And um, so right. I've usually seen people um, been burned by this before um, from one of two things, either one, they're using um, just an RPA to do um, kind of data extraction or OCR, um, and it's it, that's too rule based, or they're using a very generalist product, which has kind of promised them the earth, but actually in reality is not suited for the task. Um, so I think that that's the biggest thing we've seen, just failed projects. Um, and so, yeah, and, and I think that comes back to that, um, I guess, really validating that the technologies work, go and run pilots and see the data extraction. And then you should be able to see that pretty quickly with, with a technology that works. Well, and what about um, not using the solution to the fullest? I think that that's a really big issue. And yeah. I think Matt wants to jump in on that one. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so what, I, what I've seen is actually, you know, there's actually been um, articles on adoption rates of, of RPA. And I think it's coming from the, the companies that just sell the frameworks only to the companies. 
Okay. And so when the company say, great, I just purchased an RPA, uh, you know, framework, the, the framework company or the company doesn't say, oh, well, you know, they, they do it after the fact, but they say, now you've got to hire design uh, developers and you've got to hire consultants to implement that framework in order for your business. And I think that's something that Jenna and, and, and my company are doing is that we're actually building, you know, basically full solutions to where they don't have to, they don't have to build out a framework. They don't have to, you know, hire developers, you know, to do that. It's, it's pretty much already built in and, and ready to go. Awesome. Can, can I jump in on that one, Sarah? Yeah. Just so, yeah, just, uh, from an integration standpoint, we sort of have that same approach that, you know, you can go buy an EDI tool but it doesn't have all the logistics knowledge built into it and you have to still hire to that knowledge. And I yeah. think what a lot of industry specific tools do, whether RPA and integration, it's the same, is bring, what are you supposed to do? What are the best practices, right? How, you know, anybody theoretically could drop a couple million dollars into a machine learning team to recreate what Jenna has, but why the hell would you? Right. Just buy it. and. I think that that domain expertise is really the thing that if you're evaluating partner, same as, same as um, you know, hiring somebody to move your freight, you know, anybody can be a freight forwarder, but not everybody can get your, your shipment to move during peak, right? And yeah. that level of expertise, I think, is huge. Great. Well, so we've got, we've actually got quite a few questions and I know that we've only got probably about 10 minutes or so. So I'm going to get to some of the audience questions right now. So Mike Cadio says, I'm talking to a lot of RPA solution providers that have prospects coming out of the woodwork, but they think RPA is a cure all. How many engagements are you seeing where the client process really isn't a candidate for RPA because it is in constant flux versus processes that are well suited for RPA augmentation? Do you want to take that one, Brian? Um, can I pass on that one real quick? Yeah, I was sure. doing some Matt, of the administrative Jenna, background of running in. the show. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> I can, I can answer quickly on this. I mean, we, um, yeah, I think it's really understanding, again, going back to that problem and what it is you're trying to solve. So yeah. for our company, we only handle um, data extraction, really. Um, and then when you need to go and automate tasks within systems, we say, actually, now you should look for a vendor for that. So look you, for somebody you, else. Yeah, yeah, you need to speak to someone who's very frank about what they can and can't do. Yeah, so it's really you know up to the customer to really identify what those issues are first and sort of work from there, right? Because some solutions are going to work for, for some of the tasks that you're doing and, and some are going to work for those tasks once they are automated for you, right? Further along the chain. Matt? Uh, that's exactly how we come into companies. We say, where's your biggest leakage you know, on a yeah. month basis? You know, where, where's your biggest inefficiencies? You know, what's, you know, what's causing a little bit of your pain points. And so, you know, that's what really what we do first. We're, we're a little bit different, I think, than Jenna. I think we're, we're just more of like a, um, maybe like an RPA facilitator to where we're actually doing a combination of conversation, email, workflow, and documents. So we're, right. we're really kind of really along that whole, um, the whole path of, of, uh, of RPA, but, um, yeah, you're right. You have to know what you want, what problem you want to solve first, right? I mean, we've, there's a lot of challenges. We've got a lot of different areas that we need to take a look at. And it's really about identifying what those pressing ones are first. And then, you know, starting to look at the tools that can help with that. And then again, down the line. So Nick Chubb says, do any panel members have a sense of the financial cost of manual processes and errors today? And what might, what that might look like with the high adoption of RPA? Matt? Uh, it's a $418 billion. Wow. That's operational costs. That's ocean. That's basically all of transportation. So that's how big the market is. And wow, so that's huge. Yeah. And so if you can, uh, you know, at least take 5% of that out of the market, you know, 10% out of the market. I mean, that's, that's, that's really huge. So awesome. think about it. Think about this. Um, it's always the sort of way I think about it is when somebody is double keying and swivel heading between two systems, Yes. that time that they do that, 
I don't even care, to be honest. That's not the cost. The cost is when they miskey that arrival date. Mm -hmm. And then there's an email sent from the shipper that has the software provider on it. It's got the forwarder on it. It's got the 13 vendors on it. And it's this and that. And then you have to go attend a data quality session and you have to bring your executives. That money, the money of the explosion of the emails and the cleaning up of the messes. Yeah. To me, as when I, from an operational standpoint, that was what we always worried about, right? Like it was the you know, a hundred emails that come from the one mistake that was so much worse than, you know, the one employee's time to type the data. Not including the phone calls. Oh my God. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so you take all that, yeah. right. To not make the mistake because the robot is going to be more consistent is, is priceless. You can look at, you can look at any, any technology out there in the industry, but RPA and integrations are going to change the way logistics companies work today. Pretty soon, yeah. you know, like in five years, you know, you'll be able to, you know, as a, as an operations person at a logistics company, you'll be able to say, do I want to do this or do I want a bot to do this? And then you can just relegate whatever the, the manual task is, you know, to the bot to actually, you know, uh, do some other things. So I, I think there are some, some it is going to definitely change the way logistics companies work. Well, and I think that, you know, it's taking it from a reactive environment into more of a proactive, predictive environment is where we all need to get to anyways, because we are in a chain, right? Supply chain, right? Everything that we do affects di different parts of that chain. And you're right, Brian, if we make one mistake in one area, it explodes and there's a huge mess to clean up and with the technologies and different things that we have out there, we shouldn't have to do that anymore. I mean, eventually kind of wishful <laughs> thinking, I guess at this point, eventually <laughs> we're getting there. <laughs> um, so Nailesh says companies that have in-house RPA teams, are they, are you guys open to working mm -hmm. um, with them for specific projects or do they tend to complicate the process? Good question. So do you guys want me to take this one since I'm not selling an RPA solution and <laughs> they're all going to have to go talk to those teams? Because uh, I can tell you what it's like from an integration standpoint. Um, when we go into a company, because most forwarders have some sort of EDI or integration in-house already. Um, and what we find is that early days, there is a lot of change resistance. There's a lot of, hey, you know, we're here to do this. Are you telling us we're not good at our job? Is there, you know, are you just outsourcing our function? And what we work very hard to do at the beginning is establish that, no, we're here to supplement and augment. And maybe you're not, maybe you won't be quite as hands on the keyboard, uh, but there's still a lot of institutional knowledge and depth that's important. And what we find is that it's, it's our, our job as software vendors to make those people into allies where, you know, I, I like to say to my team that after, at the first QBR, if, if the executive says they're going to fire us, that person should threaten to quit. That's how you know that you're providing value to the team as well. Right. Um, so yeah, there is definitely change management and definitely resistance when there's an in-house team. Uh, anybody, anybody would have that. It's natural. Uh, you have to earn that trust. That's, you know, that's a great answer because, and change management is coming up in every single conversation that we're having. You know, it's a leadership skill that everybody needs to have because at the end of the day, everything's changing so fast, whether it's RPA, AI, machine learning, and that is really going to be a key skill to be able to navigate those waters and figure out what's good for your company, figure out what's good for your teams and how we can all collaborate and sort of make that happen. So I don't have a name on this one, but this is a really good point. So this person says different logistics companies may use different technologies and, you know, being working at a 3PL for as long as I did, I know this to be totally true. <laughs> you know, they've got different systems, WMS systems, CMS systems, you know, accounting systems, that kind of thing. So he's saying, can automation solve this problem to bring everyone under the same umbrella so that users do not need to go from different platforms to choose um, different carriers or I guess, you know, different functionalities within their companies? Well, I think... Brian has a really good product for this, um, you know, with the integration that he has, integration solution that he has. Um, I, I can say that 
whatever there's not an API, then that's kind of where, you know, RPA kind of comes in is using those software bots to integrate between systems that are not able to use a EDI or, or, or API. So I kind of consider RPA is uh, API on steroids, quite honestly, with, uh, with how you can kind of connect systems with that's software a, bots. Yeah, that's a really great analogy. Jenna, did you want to jump in on that one quickly? Um, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I do think, um, you know, whether it's RPA or uh, kind of integrations, yeah, absolutely, all these automation technologies can, can sync up the systems. Um, awesome. Um, one last question from Amir uh, that I just saw, RPA versus orchestration. Does anybody want to jump on on that one? Is there a difference? I can, yeah, I mean, so orchestration, think about the whole swim lane, RPA, could be dealing with an entire business process, but often is dealing with a piece of the business process. So you think about it, you know, orchestration might be everything coordinating to, you know, whether it's from origin all the way to delivery or whether it's just origin onto the ship that yeah. you could have an orchestration and then you may use RPA and integration and humans and physical robots all within that to solve different pieces of that orchestration. Yeah. And that's a really important piece, right? We have to remember that it's all of those different pieces that really are going to collaborate and uh, move everything forward. Okay, so before we wind this down, um, I don't want to stop the conversation, but I kind of have to. Time is dictating. Um, I'm going to let all of you guys answer. What is one task that everyone in this audience needs to look at in their own supply chains that could be automated right away that would bring efficiency and cost saving opportunities. Jenna, go. Uh, manual data entry from documents. All right, Matt. Customer response, because if you can respond back in the customer first and be the early bird gets the worm, then you will get the business. And customer experience is everything these days, right? Yes. Dictates it. It dictates everything down the chain. Exactly. Brian, great payment. It's boring. It's not customer facing, and it's a great place to experiment because it's a pure cost center where you can huh. just save money. Interesting. And if you screw up your first project and it's freight payment, it's only your vendors, not your not your uh, customers who are <laughs> upset. <laughs> so that's why I like to start there. <laughs> good point. Good point. All right. Well, thank you everyone for the panel today. I think it was a great discussion. Hopefully the audience got a lot out of this too. And then I guess it's back to Eric. <laughs>